Our guest today is Heike Freund, the COO of Marvel Fusion, a Munich-based startup developing a laser-driven fusion power plant. Prior to joining Marvel, Heike worked for 10 years and became a partner at McKinsey. In this episode, we'll go deep into fusion energy, which is essentially the energy produced by the sun. Fusion makes sci-fi become reality. If achieved, it could alter humankind forever. So we're glad to have one of the leading fusion companies in Europe on the show. Welcome, Heike. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. So to kick things off, I'd like to get personal for a minute and better understand why you picked Fusion as your next challenge after a big consulting at McKinsey. I'm always fascinated about what drives people major, major career shift. Yeah, I mean, honestly speaking, Fusion came a bit to me by coincidence. Um, as a coincidence, I met uh, Moritz von der Linden, the CEO of Marvel Fusion, while I was still at McKinsey, and I was super happy at McKinsey. I loved consulting, and I meet Moritz for lunch, and um, he tells me about fusion, and I was fascinated. I mean, hearing that there is an energy source that is CO2-free, safe, reliable, and that could produce the CO2-free, clean energy here, I mean, that is amazing, right? And something like from all the work I was doing with my clients, I definitely realized we will need a lot more electricity and we will need clean CO2 free safe electricity in order to save our planet, right? And then I meet Moritz, the CEO from Marvel Fusion, and he's telling me that there is this great Munich based um, fusion startup that is really doing a paradigm shift in fusion. And happy to talk more about that um, later on, but like who pulled together the greatest physicists, laser scientists, and so on in the world here in Munich to make fusion happen. And then I decided to, to leave McKinsey after 10 years and, and join the fusion company. That is a big leap. And as you explained, fusion is considered often as the holy grail of energy. And I would love to know briefly why it would be a game changer in solving the world's energy crisis. Yeah, I mean, the basic principle of fusion is easy. You fuse two nuclei, and when they fuse, they release huge amounts of energy. Now, um, the downside is that in the past, it didn't work. And they're like the more traditional approaches to fusion try to leverage huge magnets, long times, high temperatures. And that is something that science has been looking into for quite an amount of years. And at Marvel Fusion, we took a step back, leveraging latest insights from different um, technologies. So we are leveraging latest insights from the laser industry. We are utilizing ultra short pulse, highly intense laser pulses that shoot on nanostructured fuel pellets and actually start the uh, fusion reaction by depositing the energy from the laser in the fuel pellet, then starting the fusion reaction and then creating heat and charged particles, which can then be translated into energy. So that is the basic principle of fusion. And that is what we are doing at Marvel Fusion. Okay. And could you paint us just uh, taking a step back, you know, um, we're talking about the societal change here. Could you paint us a, a picture of the world that runs on nuclear fusion? For example, how could you change transportation, food production, manufacturing, or even space travel? Yeah, the world yeah, is yeah, going to totally. be... Let, let's start with the world, maybe. So starting yeah. with the world, um, fusion could produce... Um, CO2-free, clean, safe energy on a very small amount of, of, of land. So with the size of a football field, um, you could produce one gigawatt of power. That is comparable to some of the large power plants that we have out there currently. So you could produce energy where you need it. You can produce it next to an industrial plant. You can produce it next to a big city. You don't need a lot of space. So um, you can really produce it where you want it. You are not dependent on wind, water, the sun, and so on. You have a 24 seven base load energy source. So that can dramatically change the world because you need less space to produce the energy. You, um, you don't um, create any CO2, um, which I mean, we can, could talk like the whole episode about the impact that like not having any more CO2 produced has. And, um, and it is um, clean, so the, 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 the big um, advantage of nuclear fusion, the way we do it, is that you don't create any long-lived um, waste, and you don't have um, any um, possibilities of a chain reaction, so it's totally safe, and you don't create um, long-lived waste. And now, if we then change the world and make the world an amazing place to live in, 
uh, fusion could also ser serve as um, a space propulsion. So it could really give you the option to have um, interplanetary um, uh, travel. But That's maybe right. let's Elon... take that after we saved the world. So Elon needs you in a way. So now that's great, right? That's why people describe it as the holy grail. Now, the ongoing joke about fusion, taking the, the other stance, is that we will always be 30 years away from having fusion. So what is the actual level of maturity today? So I think the big change that we are doing at Marvel Fusion is that we are leveraging latest technology from different um, disciplines. So we are leveraging latest technology from the laser development. We are leveraging latest technology from material science and combining all of that in a company. So that is um, a huge advantage. Um, we have developed this approach. Um, we have been validating this approach already. We are currently using external laser facilities to validate this approach. In parallel, we already developed our own technology for our power plant, and we want to have commercial power plants within the next 10 years. Oh, and okay. I'm strongly convinced that the planet needs these power plants in the next 10 years. If we look at everything that is going on in the world currently, we definitely need fusion in the next 10 years. And you talk about the laser technology as opposed to magnetic or tokamak. Yep. Tell us how it differentiates from other fusion projects. Could you dive into the difference between magnetic and laser technology? Yeah, happy to. So magnetic-based fusion is the more traditional approach to fusion where you use big magnets to make the fusion work. So it's big magnets, long times, and large temperatures. And now laser-based fusion is a totally new approach to fusion where you use ultra short pass high-intense lasers shoot on a fuel pellet and then actually start the fusion reaction by deploying laser energy in the fuel pellet. So two very different te technological approaches to solve the same question. And uncertain promises as of today. Magnetic could be the, whole, the, the big winner as laser could. Laser is a lot more commercially attractive. Um, lasers um, have shown significant technological improvements in the past years. The laser technology we are using now is called chirp pulse amplification. It got rewarded with a physics Nobel Prize in 2018. So this is all still very new and cutting edge technology that we are utilizing here. So from my point of view, laser-based is the way to go. It's, um, it's new technology. It's a lot of innovation happening on the laser side and it's um, a lot more commercially attractive. Um, at the end, I always say, it's not a winner takes it all market infusion. Happy to see many, um, many different techniques that, um, that will succeed in the end. My personal opinion is that laser based fusion is the way to go. If you look at the whole, um, I would say, broader fusion landscape, there are around 35 fusion companies out there. Um, maybe two thirds or so of them are using magnets, and the third are using other drivers, and lasers being one of them. And what's the, ge the geographical breakdown, roughly, of those 35? Maybe 30 in the U.S. or so, and then okay. <laughs> five in Europe. So it's, I That's mean, a good reality check. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, and it, I was just in the U.S. again uh, in, in March, and it definitely feels like fusion is more or less um, mainstream. Um, or, or right, right, in terms of capital US, deployment, for sure. Uh, if you look but at not capital in terms deployment, of for sure. Maturity. Um, yeah, but... Um, and in, in Europe, I think we are around five um, private companies currently in Europe that are pursuing. Great. It. Yeah. Let's weigh that, that flag high. Well, actually, as often in, in fringe tech in the US, you know, talking about biotech, talking about uh, um, uh, even pharma, you know, we've seen during the COVID crisis, US startups are massively more capitalized than European ones. And there's, it's no exception to fusion. So just to, to give a bit of context, Commonwealth Fusion, the leading flat carrier, yep. has raised $2 billion from Monster Fronts, Tiger Global, Kosla, Temasek. There's also Helion Energy that has raised $570 million. There's General Fusion from Canada that has raised north of $320 million. What is the place of Europe in this global race to fusion energy? Uh, are we use, losing the battle? 
Um, I wouldn't be as harsh in saying at least we haven't lost the battle yet. I think the, okay. the battle is still ongoing. Definitely the U.S. Um, has been in that industry for a longer period of time. Definitely not, as you know, like uh, deep tech funding is a di different topic in the U.S. It, it might be easier to, to get uh, those, those big tickets, uh, or at least it has a more mature um, VC um, landscape over there in the U.S. with also deeper pockets. So definitely we, we see that a lot of funding has been going into U.S. companies, but we also believe that at the end, the best technology will win the race. And we are truly convinced that we have the best technology. And we also see uh, an, an increasing momentum here in Europe. We see an increasing interest from European investors. We just closed a financing round end of last year uh, with very prominent, prominent European investors as well. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely a huge momentum. What we have also seen on the investor side is alone last year, more than $2 billion went into fusion that is doubling the amount of the whole amount that went into fusion the past 10 years before that. So there's a huge momentum on the investor side currently. Is, is that from public funding? Is that from no, one specific country? private funding. Private funding, okay. 2 billion last year. And, and you said, so recently you've raised 35 million euros from Early yep. Bird, which is a generalist VC. And so Early it's, Bird it's was leading our, um, our Series A, yes. That's right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, it's interesting to, for, from our stance as we're climate people, to hear that a fusion, which is at the, the fringest of the fringe, if you will, that you managed to raise from a generalist VC and not from a dedicated climate fund. Is, is there a lack of dedicated cl climate capital in Europe, or is there a reason why you picked a generalist one? So I would say Early Bird has proven in the past that they are. A very good deep tech, deep tech investor. They are also invested in ESA Aerospace, for example. So I would definitely consider them as, as one of the prime deep tech investors in Europe. And I also see more and more climate funds um, being announced. I mean, currently it's like every morning that I open the news, uh, I hear of a new um, climate fund um, being announced either by the big PEs and so on. So I think the momentum That's is right. definitely there. There is certainly a, a lot of P or large growth funds and billions being poured. We don't really know as insiders whether that is being deployed yet or is it you know, to buy a Tesla shares or Northvolt gigafactories. We don't see that capital flowing into startups you know, very early stage yet. So we need still more funding in climate tech early stage. I would say as always, the more the merrier. Um, I think yeah. there's so many problems we need to address. I believe fusion as a technology that could solve so many of the problems we are facing. I also believe that there is many other technologies out there that can really make the world a better place. And we need more, more funding into, into these moonshot ideas and um, rather than incremental increases of existing business models and existing technologies. Yeah, indeed. And talking about billions of funding, where would the, those billions of euros come from? Right, so we need billions to build a commercial prototype, to hit a commercial and industrial scale, or even just uh, being able to commercialize the first prototype. Uh, is it mainly going to come from governments or states? When do you think they will step in with big money? So I mean, I'm I'm the wrong one to answer that question, right? You need to ask that question to a politician. But in my point of view, it should always be a fair mix of public money, private money. Uh, money coming from, from, from different pockets, right? But I would definitely also see that, um, um, yeah, the states and politics should have a high interest in, in, in pushing topics like fusion and other, other moonshot ideas. Well, this is uh, where it gets interesting, right? So from a political stance, ITER in the south of France has been highly politicized and highly funded. I think they have received north of $20 billion for its construction, but the construction has not exactly. been finalized. Now we're even considering 45 to 60 billion to reach completion. So it strikes to me that fusion could be a, a drain, why right? we might dig, dig, dig into a bigger hole, but we, without really necessarily reaching the breakthrough that we expect from such a project. Meanwhile, there are startups or even uh, research labs like the UK-based JET lab, uh, which has done more breakthroughs than ETA. Do you think 
ITER is too big to fail, too big not to fail, or it's just the nature of this enormous project not to deliver? Maybe two ideas on that. One or, or two answers to that. One is I believe we need more technological openness when we talk about fusion. So ITER is pursuing one approach, magnetic-based fusion. Uh, but there are other approaches out there. And as you're saying, fusion is one of the biggest problems in, in physics to solve. So we should be open about uh, technologies. And in my point of view, also fund um, a portfolio of technologies. And laser is a different technology and there might be more out there, right? And um, the second um, um, answer to your question is, uh, I think we have seen in other settings that it sometimes helps to like bring these very complex um, problems into an entrepreneurial setup. And um, I, like, we have so many more um, yeah, spaces of freedom. We take very entrepreneurial approaches. We do a lot of things in parallel. We are able to take certain risks. We are able to cut off um, dead ends quickly and so on. So all these kind of freedoms that you have in an entrepreneurial setup and um, it's an old example, but it's a bit of that like SpaceX, another example, right? Like we're like taking these complex setup or problems into a private startup setup can open new um, degrees of freedom. Yeah, I would uh, tend to agree here. <laughs> Startups and entrepreneurs can be a little scrappy, but they cut uh, the corners and typically get yeah, to Yeah, plus I think also maybe uh, one third aspect is I think we are also a lot freer to really bring in all the kind of different disciplines and so on. Plus, the other thing we are doing, we are also not reinventing everything by ourselves, but we are also building a strong ecosystem with industrial partners. So industrial partners on the power plant side, industrial partners on the laser system side, industrial partners for our fuel targets that we need and really like pulling together the best people that are out there to solve the problem, either within the company or in the product ecosystem. Tell us more about this kind of partnerships. You've announced partnerships with Siemens, with Thales. Are they a, actively on the day-to-day -day operation of Marvel, or is this really a side project for them, just for a bit of the PR, making sure that they're so diversified? We are very actively working with all of our partners. So we are very actively working with Siemens Energy to already develop the power plant concept of a fusion power plant in the, in the future. Um, so the end product that we have from our fusion reaction is heat and charged particles. And we are working with Siemens Energy of how to convert these into electricity. Then on the laser side, we are working with Trumpf and with Thales, who mm -hmm. are the best two laser companies in, in the world. And we are developing with them jointly already our future laser system that we will need in our future power plant. So um, these are really... Um, really great partners. And um, I think this is also, if we talk about speed and acceleration, it's so important um, to really build on the expertise that is out there to bring together the best partners and then work on these topics jointly. And now any insight to share with other fellow entrepreneurs that might agree, right? They would agree that corporates need to play a role, but they struggle to get access to the right people. How yep. do you crack partnership with big corporates in Europe? So I would say you need to be a bit patient, obviously, because these are big companies. Um, some of them are DAX listed companies and so on. So it takes time to set up contracts. It takes time to form these partnerships. But I would say this is very well invested time. And um, for other fellow entrepreneurs, I would tell them, um, uh, I, so I would always build these partnerships, be patient, um, in, invest that time, um, because at the end, um, it, it, over the long term, it will make things so much, so much faster. And in terms of networking, I mean, obviously, you come from McKinsey. McKinsey is a big brand. It opens doors. Is Has it helped Marvel? Or do you think even earlier, in the early years of, of Marvel, uh, just the fact that they were at the fringe and something that a corporate cannot handle on, on their own was sufficient to open doors? I would say it's both. Obviously, there are some people I still know from my McKinsey days, and uh, it's always easy to, to connect with somebody you already know. But on the other side, this topic of fusion and the topic of saving the world and this topic of providing a CO2-free, reliable energy source is something that excites 
everyone I talk to, right? So um, every every company I, I talk to, and if, if you uh, tell them the vision and also especially the impact that fusion could play, that usually opens the doors quite quickly. Now, going back to Marvel for a minute, and we talked about the economic perspective a bit. How do you make money today? Do you have contracts? Do you have um, MOUs? How do you currently make money or how is this projected over the next five to 10 years? Currently, we don't make any money, right? Because I think that is a bit the, the profile of a deep tech company, right? It's a bit the same as you have in biotech. It's the same as you have a, in, in many of these deep tech um, uh, endeavors where for the first years, you're not making any money. Um, and that is why you need funding to, um, to push forward these, um, um, these, um, these, these endeavors. And then later on, it's definitely part of our business model to uh, eventually then, um, then have fusion power plants, right? But um, that will take some time. And we are obviously also looking at options for early revenue generation. So seeing is there technology development that you can commercialize already earlier on in the process. Um, however, that is also something that is always a fine line between like how much do you want to dilute in some term your core product, how much speed do you, do you, um, might, may you lose on the way to your North Star? So, um, so that's something that always needs to be very carefully assessed. Have you observed that heavily capitalized startups in the US have not really spent time looking at the commercialization of it, making money? No, I wouldn't or- say so. I think that is something like I see like when talking to other fusion companies in the US. And um, I think it's something where everybody is looking at, okay, what might be options for early revenue generation? How much does it really um, speed up the, um, the, or how much speed might you lose in between on the other side? Yeah, so I think this is something that every, every company that I talk to in the fusion space is looking at. Now, for people that dream of working in fusion, yeah. now that you've raised capital, what roles do you have available at Marvel and where do you advise people to knock at, be it at Marvel or other fusion startups in Europe? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you want to work in fusion, Marvel is the number one to go to because I strongly believe that we have developed the approach that, that will lead to commercial fusion power plants. And within Marvel, we have a great team of theoretical physicists, experimental physicists, um, laser scientists, engineers, but also in the in the corporate areas we have, um, because I, I always feel like this also needs to go hand in hand with having also, we have a strong legal department, we have strong IT department and so on. But I would say basically there's all roles um, that um, mm-hmm, that you could imagine um, are within Marvel Fusion and people should just go on our website. We are also always looking for, um, for even, so even if there is uh, not that position posted that somebody might be looking out for. There's always a contact that you can reach out to and um, maybe there's an option, yeah. Now, going back a bit more personal for a minute, I have always been fond of Fusion. Fusion is, uh, again, science fiction. And I'm trying to, as an investor, to look at it from a real eye to get a bit of a reality check. And you also come from McKinsey, right? So you um, look at stats, you want traction, you want real numbers. What has, since you joined Marvel, been one of the, the most important surprises or unexpected events that you've uh, encountered since you, you joined the company? Um, I would say surprises on, a, on the positive side is definitely how fast things can move if you put the best people together in a room, right? Um, seeing how, how one idea can lead to the next idea and see how, how these things can evolve. That is, is simply amazing. Um, I think uh, what came as a surprise rather on the um, maybe, or things that I would have hoped for that work faster is really, um, yeah, negotiation with laser facilities, um, existing facilities where we're trying to book time to do experiments, being that in Europe and being that in the US. Um, that is something um, where, uh, yeah, I mean, we would love to do more experiments and get more access to uh, existing facilities. We now managed to secure 
three new um, slots for this year. And the slot is always like a month long campaign. So that is amazing. Um, but that is always um, hard work to get these. Do you never lose sleep at night thinking, oh, we might have uh, missed that, that turn or, or made the wrong decision? Yeah, but I think at the end, it's also all about risk taking, right? And it's all about like, fail early, right? Like whenever there's a new idea, like trying to find an option where we can test out that idea, trying to find an experimental setup where we can test new ideas, because at the end, and you know that as well from your past, right? Like fail early is so important. Um, spending the money, then knowing whether something works or doesn't work is so much, so much better than, than not having that. Um, yeah. Failing early, that is the key of startups. Now yeah. talking about failing, I'm going to enter the rapid fire round where Ooh. you cannot fail. There's no right or wrong. You know the principle. I'm going to ask a very simple question with two options and you can answer briefly in one sentence. Are you ready? Hope so. All right. Itel, success or failure? I would say success in making Fusion more broader available and people knowing about Fusion. Failure in terms of um, speed. What's the more likely scenario for Marvel? Getting acquired or IPO? IPO. Ooh, saying that with confidence. Now, what is more likely to unfuck our planet and drive massive climate impact? Politics or business? Hopefully a combination. That is too politically correct. <laughs> Uh, then let's put it that way. I believe business is faster. At the end, politics also needs to be part of the solution. I would tend to agree. Now, talking about you are based in Munich, what is Germany's views on nuclear fusion? Are they pro or against? More and more pro. And, and to note that there's a, a huge difference from a risk profile between fission and fusion, obviously. And exactly, you... because maybe just to round that up, fusion does not have the harm of chain reaction and does not produce any long-lived nuclear waste. So at the end, it's really two very, very different things that unfortunately sound very similar. Monopoly or open sourcing? Would you rather build the next enormous fusion monopoly, think the Google of fusion, or share all the knowledge from Marvel for local champions to emerge and replicate? Think about You've cracked it, you had a recipe, now you're spreading it so that every country that has its intricacies, specificities, can just quickly pick up the baton and run with their own solution. So I would say, given that um, we already um, built this ecosystem, we are definitely not in a monopoly situation, but rather like having this ecosystem of partners that can also then help to scale it quickly around the world. All right. Now... Just to wrap things up, a cool carve out. I'd like to leave people, the audience, with some, some takeaways. So if you guys want to dig deeper into the world of fusion, I suggest listening to TIL. It's a Today I Learned Climate podcast from MIT on fusion energy, which goes really deep in everything fusion. We'll link everything in the show notes, and we'll also add all the startup working in fusion to date. Heike mentioned 35, roughly 30 in the US. It's a very important list you have. Hopefully that will give ideas to more players in Europe and they can partner with Marvel. And any parting thoughts from you, Heike? Anything you would like to leave as important insight to our audience working in Fusion or um, looking at it with interest? I would say, first of all, thanks, John, for um, bringing Fusion into your podcast. I believe a lot more people should know about Fusion, should know that it's not 30 years out, but that if we put the right efforts into it now, we can have a solution within the next 10 years. I believe it's truly important to have Fusion, and, um, uh, yeah, and Fusion will definitely play, play a major role in the energy mix of the future if we want to achieve our 1.5 degree goal and, and so on. So um, thanks for, for providing a platform for Fusion. And yeah, as you said, people who are interested in Fusion, I believe there's lots of material out there. You can also go to our website. Uh, we put a lot of um, information on Fusion also on our website. And if you're then interested, reach out on LinkedIn or through our website. And um, yeah, very happy to, to get in touch with you. Thanks so much, Heike, for this delightful conversation on Fusion. 
I'll definitely link everything for people to get in touch. Lovely speaking with you. Thanks, John. Take care. Bye-bye.